geometry. But before Bayesian geometry, let's discuss muna the basic definitions. So first, let's talk about geometry. What is geometry? Geo means earth. Metri means to say measure. So we have earth and measure. So we have what we call the geometry. So geometry has been here for centuries. It's one of the oldest branches in mathematics. And when you say geometry, we talk about size, points, line, shapes, two-dimensional, three-dimensional objects. So who are the people behind geometry? So here we have Fields of Miletus. Papapansin nyo to, pag before Christ, pag before Christ ng mga known mathematicians, laging yung pangalan nila, is say, for example, Jabez of Quezon City. <laughs> it has to do with the place where they're in. So for Th Thales of Miletus, Pythagoras of Samos. So they talk about the person of that place. So galun sila pinapangalan. So we have here Thales of uh, Thales of Miletus. He's he's the one who talks about circle that is bisected by a diameter. So we have a circle, meron diameter. Yung pinakamahaba na chord na kaya mo ilagay sa si isang circle, we call it the diameter. He also talks about the base of an equilateral triangle. Kung equal yung side ng, dalawang side ng triangle, yung base niya, itong angles na dito ay equal. And he talks about the angle of a semicircle. Kung meron kang kalahating below, then pag hinati mo yan, the angle there will be a 90 degree. Pythagoras of Samos, you're very familiar with this guy because he is the one who started the Pythagorean theorem. Pythagorean theorem only works with right triangles. Kung naalala nyo, ito yung formula na a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. So yeah, that's Pythagoras where we got the Pythagorean theorem. The next ones are Socrates, Socrates and Hippocrates. Socrates is very known with his contribution in philosophy and literature, but he actually is a person who has some contribution in mathematics and science, especially in his recordings of his work. So he started that. But of course, these are the older people. This is before Christ. Um, Mathematician. The next one is Hippocrates. Hippocrates is the first Greek mathematician. He works with squaring the circles. So if you remember, the area of a circle is pi r squared. So why is that squared? So Hippocrates, Hippocrates has something to say with that. The next one is, you're familiar with this, Plato. Plato is another person who has a high contribution in, in philosophy and in sciences, in literature, but he he has he led many works that discovers mathematics and science uh, discoveries in mathematics and sciences. He led some work that discovers some theories, some concept in mathematics and sciences. He founded the Academy of Athens. The next one is the guy that we will be talking about today. We call him Euclid of Alexandria or simply Euclid. Euclid is known as the father of geometry. So, siya talaga yung topic natin today. Kaya tayo may tinatawag na Euclidian geometry. So, he's that guy. And he's very known with his publication and that is the publication of the elements. The next one is Archimedes and Hipparchus. So Archimedes, he he start he has a book that talks about the measurement of a circle and how the how we calculate pi. Di ba dalal nyo si pi? Siya ay 3.14 approximately. So let's just put approximately 3.14. Archimedes has something to say about that a lot, and he wrote he wrote it in a book. Hipparchus of Rhodes, he's the one. He had a method of solving spherical triangles and also made an early formulation of trigonometry. If you're familiar, and I think you're familiar with trigonometry, it's the sine, cosine, tangent, etc., etc. So he started that, but he's not really the one who, who coined those concepts yet. 
Hipatia. Hipatia, he worked, she, she's a woman. He, she is a woman who studied in a higher level of geometry that has to do with conics, hyperbolas, ellipses, and parabolas. Ayabatha, he's from India. This guy has to do work with cosine and sine and introduce some, some ideas that translate from spear, with spears and pyramids. The next one is Albatani. Albatani, it's AD. Ano nga ibig sabihin ng AD after... Wait lang guys ha. AD versus BC. AD means Anno Domini. In the year of the Lord. Okay. In the year of the Lord. Okay. In the year of the Lord. <laughs> in the year of Christ. So AD. During that time. Thanks to his knowledge in astronomy, he we were able to discover he was able to discover the trigonometric functions of cotangent. If you're familiar, tangent, cotangent. It's the inverse version of that. So, and trigonometric formulas for right triangles. And Rene Descartes. Rene Descartes is a really famous man. Of course, he's after na siya kay Christ. He appeared on the Makita mo, di ba? Normally, Socrates of oh, no. Euclid of Alexandria. Ito si Rene Descartes talaga. Si Rene Descartes, Rene Descartes has a lot of contribution in algebra, in mathematics in general, and even in in logic. Kung napansin nyo before, meron tayong not, and, or, meron siyang Descartes rule of sign that can transform that to another form. So Descartes is a very famous mathematician, but he is more known with his coordinate system, the way that we locate points in a plane. And you're very familiar with this. He is the guy who made the Cartesian coordinate system. Yung x and y axis natin, we have x and y axis. This is the guy who made that standard, the coordinate system. So we have the cards, the Cartesian coordinates. Itself. The next one is Johann Carl Friedrich Gauss. He's, um, he's a mathematician na nag-move nag na from non-Euclidean geometries. Pag-usapan natin siya later, I will show you a video when we say non-Euclidean. Then the next one is Maricus Cornelius Escher. He is not really a mathematician, but he's a graphic artist. A graphic artist that heavily inspired by mathematics. So he created impossible construction as well as tessellations. Harold Cossiter, Harold Cossiter naman, he works with regular polytopes and higher dimension geometries. Um, Benoit Mandeldroth, he talks about fractal geometry, and he has called what a Mel Mandeldroth set that contains fractal shapes. Now, let's talk about, yan, so tapos na tayo sa mga tao. Madami pa yan, but they are the, like, for geometry, they're the basic people <laughs> in geometry. Now let's go to our axiom, postulate, and theorems. So what is the difference between an axiom, a postulate, and a theorem? An axiom and postulates are called the universal truth. They cannot be proved, but they are true. Like, sabihin natin maganda ka, guapo ka. We cannot prove that, but they are true. <laughs> Joke lang, guys. So we have what we call the Actions and postulate. Mapapansin yung mamaya. Bakit masasabi natin na parang true talaga siya? Hindi lang natin mapuproof. The next one is theorems. It's a statement which can be proved. A statement, a theorem, can be proved or disproved. So an example of that is a very known Pythagorean theorem, Big Bang Theory. And other theorems that can be proved or disproved in bet with better theorems later on. Now, so Euclid, let's go back to the father of geometry, and that is Euclid. 
Sikat si Euclid because he actually wrote a book that entitled that entitled that has a title of the elements. He talks about five postulates when it comes to Euclidean geometry. When we say Euclidean geometry, we are just dealing with what we call a plain type geometry. Yung elementary geometry natin. Yung high school geometry natin. So, yeah. Basahin ko na yung definition ni, ni Euclid sa. Si Euclid sabi niya, before tayo mag, magtaka kung baka iba tayo ko. For example, sabihin ko chair, baka iba yung definition ng chair mo sa definition ng chair ko. So Euclid has this definition so that, that all of us will have will think the same. So he said that for him a point has no part. Isang point, point yan kasi wala siyang part. A line, commercial length. That's a line. The end of a line are points. And even within the line are points. Yan. The straight line is a line, a line, a line that evenly with points. So, kung meron kang point dito, may point ka dito, may point ka dito, this is a straight line. So, sa isang line, meron mga even point, point chat. A surface, surface as a length, ayan. The edges of the surface are lines. Di ba ang edge nito ay lines? A plane surface, a, a plane surface is a surface which lies evenly with straight line on itself. So let's say mayroon ka ako straight line dito. May straight line din ako dito. This is a plane. Di ba ito ay plane? Papel, parang plane. Yeah. So yan yung sinasabi niya. So parang tayo ng definition ng plane, ng line, ng point, ng etc. So let's have here Euclid's action. Euclid's actions are very, very obvious. And they are uh, obviously true. Okay, they're true. So, ganito lang siya. Euclid's action number one, things which are equal to the same thing are equal to one another. <laughs> Parang ganito. Kung si one ay equal kay two, at si two ay equal kay three, therefore, si one at si three equal. Like, Duh, they should be equal. But yes, we call that one of Euclid's actions. But this is not the highlight. Ha? Actions lang niya to. The next one is, if equals are added to equals, the holes are equal. What do you mean by that? Kung meron akong square, dagdagan ko ng triangle. Ah, sige. Let's say muna, I have two equal squares. So I have equals. I have two equal squares. Dagdagan ko ng equal triangles. So I have equals added to, I have equals squares added to equal triangles. The, the new answer are equal. Yun yung sinasabi niya. Kung na may, meron kong dalawang equal, nagdagan mo ng dalawang equal, di yung dalawa equal. Very obvious, but yes, that's that's one of his actions. That's that's why all actions are true. Equals are subtracted from equals, the remainder is equal. So kung meron kong equal na square, bawasan natin ng equal na circle, ang matitira, the remainders are equal. Pare. Now, things which coincide with one another are equal to one another. This is a line. Yung dalawang line na yun, equal. Kung mapapansin nyo, ma mas, di ba mas maikli yung black sa, sa blue? Not really. Because they have this ending points. Di ba, for example, itong blue, forever naman siyang pupunta dun eh. mag extend siya papunta sa side. Same goes with the black one. mag extend siya papunta din sa sides. So, yeah. So, the two are equal. Now, please remember, iba po yung line. Ang line na tinutukoy dito ni Euclid ay yung line na alam natin. Pero familiar din naman tayo sa tinatawag nating line segment. Segment. Ang tawag ni Euclid dito ay finite line. May katapusan na line. Yun yung sinasabi niya. May katapusan na line yung tawag niya dyan. The next one is, a hole is greater than the part. Of course, kung ito yung one hole mo, yung maliit na part dyan, at ito yung hole mo, di ba si hole? Mas malaki naman talaga siya dapat sa part. Yung isang slice ng pizza, mas, ay yung buong pizza, mas malaki compared sa slice ng pizza. It's kind, it's, I know it's obvious. We just follow, 
things which are double of the same things are equal to one another. Kung meron kang isang square, i-double mo. Ay, kung meron kang dalawang square, equal, equal. The pareho mo silang dinoble. Equal pa rin sila. Same goes kung kakalahatingin mo sila. I-half mo siya. These are obvious axioms. Kung ano mong doble, i-double siya. Dalawa, dinoble mo. Yung dalawa, pareho pa rin siya. Yung part, Part, mas, mal, mas maliit compared sa whole, etc. These are obviously true. So we call them axioms. But this is not the highlight of Euclid's work. The highlight of Euclid's work is this. We call them Euclid's postulate. Now, of course, overview lang yung sasabihin ko dito. Marami pang points about it. Pero overview lang yung ipapakita ko. So let's start with the one. Euclid's postulate. One can draw a straight line from any point to another, to any point. So sinasabi niyo, meron kang dalawang point. Kung meron kang dalawang point, pwede kang gumawa ng straight line. Yun yung sinasabi ni Euclid. If you, if you have two, two points, you can make a straight line. The next one. One can produce a finite straight line in a straight line, in a continuous straight line. Remember, finite state, uh, straight line is called the line segment. Familiar tayo dito. Ito yung mga lines na may katapusan, segment. At ito ay yung line. So, for example, mayroon kang mahaba na line. Ito, ito. Line. May mahaba kang line. Ang line segment, pwede ka gumawa dito ng finite. Finite may katapusan. Yan, pwede kang gumawa ng line segment sa loob ng isang buong line. So yeah, that's a postulate. That's the second postulate of Euclid. The third postulate of Euclid has this. One can describe a circle with any center or radius. Sinasabi ni Euclid, kung meron ka daw line, tawagin natin yung radius, at may center ka, sabihin natin sa 0, 0, pwede mo i-describe na ngayon ang circles. by this. So if you can now describe a circle. Diba ganun lang naman tayo mag-describe ng circle? Kung meron kang radius at meron kang center. Meron ka lang circle. <laughs> ganun lang siya. The fourth one is all right angles equal to another right angles, which is true. Kung meron kang right angle, Right angle, we know that as 90 degrees. Right? Kasi ang right angle, meron na siyang known, like a square 90 degrees. Sinasabi lang niya na lahat ng right angles, they are equal. Yes, they are equal and they are equal to 90 degrees. <laughs> Ganun lang. They are equal to 90 degrees. The next one is the fifth one. So the fifth postulate, ito yung sinasabi nila na medyo debatable. Now, marami pa to, may, may maraming concept pa to. Sinasabi ni, ano, ni Euclid, if a straight line falling in two straight lines makes the interior angle on the same side less than the two right angles. When we say two right angles, it's dalawang 90 degrees. But we're more familiar with the concept of 180 degrees. Tinatawag natin yung supplementary. Supplementary angle. 180 degrees. The two straight lines, if produced indefinitely, meet on that side on which the angles are less than two than the two right angles. Sinasabi lang niya, kung meron kang dalawang line, kung meron kang line na magmimit sila ha, magmimit sila, Magmimit sila, may dalawa kang line. Tapos, may isang line na dumaan siya sa gitna. We call it the transversal line. Sabi niya, itong nasa loob daw, this will be less than 180 degrees. Ayan, 180 degrees. Pero kung parallel naman yan, kung parallel naman yan, ito, itong dalawang nasa loob, equal naman yan sa 180 degrees. Pero more of, ang ginagamit talaga ni Euclid ay kung meron kang line at meron kang point dito, somewhere here, sabihin natin may point ka dito, pwede kang gumawa ng isang 
parallel line. Kaparallel nito. So, pwede ka din gumawa niya. So, kasama siya sa fifth postulate ni Euclid. So, that's it. That's the Euclidean geometry. Now, I will show you another PowerPoint. Did I record this already? Yes, I recorded this already. I will show you another PowerPoint. know that the Euclidean geometry is is the one that we had is the one that this that is discussed in our elementary and high school days and even college days but it's also a concept of non-Euclidean so in non-Euclidean geometry di ba may five postulates si, si Euclid sabi niya kung mayroon kang isang point at isang point nakagawa ka ng line if you have two distinct points you can make one and only one line. We have another one. In a straight line segment can be straight line segment. You can draw actually a, a circle at the same measurement. And then the fifth one, if it falls into a straight line makes interior angles on the same line less than two right angles or less than 180 degrees Parallel, and then if the two lines if produced indefinitely meet on the other side the angles less than two, two again another way of saying this is parallel lines never meet initial obvious statement na to, pero kasama siya sa mahabang statement na ni Euclid. Now, ito. Now, I want to discuss the two types of non-Euclidean. There are other non-Euclidean non-Euclidean geometry. I want to discuss it here, but I think it's better if we watch a video about it. Kasi hindi na siya two-dimensional. Hindi na siya magdodrawing ng line. Hindi na siya simple. So, I will show you a video about non-Euclidean so I got I, I think this is the best I look for better ones but I think this is the best way to explain non-Euclidean geometry at magigets nyo kung bakit kailangan ng video para dito so guys can you tell me if you can kind of visualization hyperbolic space is so cool but if you've ever seen any kind of visualization odds are it was this or this or, oh god the worst one please not even me yes okay. okay that's good okay I'll, I'll i'll start that thank you hyperbolic space is so cool but if you've ever seen any kind of visualization odds are it was this or this or, oh god the worst one please stop using this one but none of these really gave me a feeling of what it's like to live in a curved space. And that was the reason I come up with what I think is the easiest way to understand hyperbolic space. Let's start off with Euclidean and spherical spaces in two dimensions, and then hyperbolic space in three dimensions come naturally later. So here's just a regular flatland 2D Euclidean plane that goes on in every direction and has no curvature. But if we add some positive curvature, we get a spherical shell. This is not a solid ball. There's no inside or outside, just an infinitely thin two-dimensional shell. We're only looking at it in 3D because we are higher dimensional beings looking down at the Flatlanders. You might think this is really similar to us living on the surface of Earth, but there's actually a big It has to do with light and lines space of a black hole. Light always travels in the shortest path in a straight line. It's just that the space itself is curved. So if the Earth actually had a spherical spacetime, then looking out at the horizon, the light you see would actually travel all the way around the Earth. In fact, there wouldn't be a horizon anymore. Things would be a lot weirder. Another way to think about curvature is with tiling. There's only three ways to tile the Euclidean plane with regular polygons. 
four squares at a vertex, six triangles at a vertex, or three hexagons at a vertex. If you were to say try pentagons, you'd find that there's not enough space for four and too much gap for three. But those gaps could get filled with spherical curvature, and you have the familiar dodecahedron. You can also do three squares around each vertex, three triangles, four triangles, or five triangles. And just a reminder, all these edges are straight lines. Everything lives on that two-dimensional shell and there's no third dimension to curve into. We're only using it to help visualize the space. So now let's move on to hyperbolic space. The theme you'll see for the rest of the video is that for everything weird about spherical geometry, the For example, you just saw that we could have fewer squares around each vertex compared to Euclidean space. So in hyperbolic space, we can have more. But how could you cram in another square? Well, maybe we can do the same trick as the sphere and just bring it out into the third dimension. We can, and here's how it looks. This is hyperbolic crochet, courtesy of Mrs. Parade. You can see how five squares meet at every vertex now, but it's still hard to visualize everything. Everywhere, it's impossible to see it all at once, and it gets even worse as we look at bigger bigger pieces of the hyperbolic plane, though it does give you a sense of how much larger hyperbolic space is compared to Euclidean. And don't forget, these are all still two-dimensional geometries that we're using an extra dimension to help visualize. If we want to go up to 3D spaces, then good luck trying to visualize the 3D surface of a 4D hypersphere, or whatever this mess would look like in four dimensions. In order to make any sense of things at this point, we're going to need a different way to visualize the hyperbolic plane. The trick we're going to use is projection. You're probably familiar with 3D projection, that is taking a 3D object and projecting it to your eyeball or a screen. For all, you're looking at this still distorted. This is supposed to be a square. Of course not. It's just that projected angles and distances can change depending on where you look at it from and what projection you use. Similarly, we can project a curved geometry to a flat one or vice versa. You're probably familiar with the Mercator projection for a sphere, but as you can tell, it introduces distortions. Greenland and Africa look about the same size here, but Africa is actually 14 times larger. Unfortunately, it's impossible to map a sphere to a plane without introducing distortion. And that's why there's hundreds of different projections, because either distances, angles, areas, or shapes will get distorted, and which compromise you want depends on the application. I'm going to be focusing on a very useful type of projection, stereographic projection. I'm not going to go into too much detail on this because Henry Segerman already has a great video that shows how all these projections work on the spherical and hyperbolic planes using just light and shadows. It's super cool, so definitely check out that video. Also, I want to thank Henry because he's been a huge help with Hyperbolica. I really don't think I could have done it without him. And his YouTube channel is totally underrated, so go subscribe if you like things like this. Okay, now that we have a better way to visualize spherical and hyperbolic space, we can start making some sense of its weird properties. But first, I have to talk about parallel universe. I, I mean lines, parallel lines. They don't exist in spherical space. Any pair of straight lines will always converge and intersect eventually. So the whole concept of two things being parallel is not a global property anymore. It's a local phenomena that only exists at a point on the line. And remember how everything hyperbolic is the opposite of spherical? Well, in hyperbolic space, lines will always diverge. Remember, both of these are straight lines, just like how this is actually a square. It just depends on what angle you're looking at it from. So walking over to the other line will shift the perspective to see it was straight the whole time. Speaking of walking, let's take a walk on the sphere. Let's walk up one tile, right one tile, 
and then down one tile. We're back where we started, and we just walked around a triangle with three right angles. In Euclidean space, a triangle's angles have to sum to 180 degrees, but in spherical space, it's always larger. But did you notice that something else weird happened? We walked around without ever changing our view direction, but when we came back to the starting point, everything's been rotated 90 degrees to the left. This is called holonomy, and it's something you don't experience in Euclidean geometry. Basically, as you move around the space, you accumulate extra rotation, even if you never change the direction you're facing. So take a guess what happens on a hyperbolic walk. We'll walk up one tile, right one tile, down one tile, left one tile, and finally up one more time. Now we've walked on a pentagon with five right angles. This time, the sum is less than you would expect for a Euclidean pentagon because polygon angles have a smaller sum in hyperbolic space than Euclidean. And we have the same holonomy effect, but this time rotated in the opposite direction. One last effect I want to talk about is a physical one. In the real world, objects are made up of smaller particles, and when an object moves, all of its particles move as well. But remember, there's no parallel lines in curved space. So an object's particles can't actually all move in the same direction. In spherical geometry, this means you'd experience a sort of squishing tidal force as you try to move through space. This is very similar to spaghettification around a black hole, which is also caused by curved space. And in hyperbolic space, objects experience a stretching tidal force as they move. With enough speed and curvature, hitting a hyperbolic baseball could actually rip it apart. Okay, let's switch over to some formulas. How would a curved space affect the circumference of a circle? It's 2 pi r in Euclidean space, but it's pi sine r in spherical space. It should kind of make sense why this is true. As the radius gets larger, it reaches a maximum circumference, then shrinks down to zero and repeats cyclically. Want to guess what the hyperbolic opposite is? It's hyperbolic sine, of course. And this is another really good example of how large this is basically to take a million times longer to walk around a circle than it would just walk across it. The area of a circle also has similar formulas. Again, area is exponential for hyperbolic space. But interestingly, it grows at the same rate as the circumference, unlike Euclidean space where it grows as the square. The Pythagorean formula also has really beautiful analogs in curved space. And finally, this was one of the coolest formulas, and there's no Euclidean version of it. In a unit curved space, you can find the area of any triangle given only its angles. And the formula is so simple. For spherical space, it's just the sum of the angles minus pi. That's it. In hyperbolic space, it's pi minus the sum of the angles. Isn't that neat? And there's a good insight from this formula. Since the sum is always less than 180 degrees in hyperbolic space, it means there's actually a maximum possible area a triangle can have. And that's when all the angles are zero degrees and the area is pi. It happens because all lines eventually diverge. So if you tried to make the triangle any larger, the edges would never be able to intersect at a vertex. So I hope that's given all of you a little better understanding of curved spaces. In the next video, I'm going to talk more about three-dimensional spaces, how I'm able to render them in Unity, and some of the really cool math behind it. If you want to build even more intuition about hyperbolic space in the meantime, there's also Hyper Rogue. It's one of the only other hyperbolic games out there right now, and it's worth checking out. Link is in the description. So thanks for coming on this journey, and stay hyperbolic. Ayan. So, nagets in ako bakit natin ng video about it. So that is that uh, we're more familiar with the Euclidean. The Euclidean is x and y axis lang. Pwede din mag x and y z axis. But when it comes to other types of geometry, pag bilog na, ang tawag na natin doon is spherical or elliptic. There's another word for it. It's called the elliptic geometry. Now, sa elliptic geometry, ito na yung ginagamit natin. So, I'll share our PowerPoint. So, for elliptic geometry, 
Ayan. Sa elliptic geometry, ayan. Siya mas ginagamit siya when it comes to to aerial navigation. Like how to how to position, global positioning and measurements. So kung na-discuss na kanina, kung napansin nyo, pag flat yung map, feeling nyo yung Greenland at yung Africa, pa pareho lang silang size. But pag kinerve mo sila, since nasa top, ma pag kinerve mo sila, malalaman natin na iba talaga yung size nila. So spherical, or what we call the elliptic geometry, has an application in aerial navigation for airplanes, for anything that's moving above the sky, global positioning and measurement, astronomy and cosmology, and other, and art, of course, and other stuff. Now, for hyperbolic naman, hyperbolic, hindi lang siya actually, nakikita siya sa nature. Like, for example, these vegetables, fractals, um, really beautiful microorganisms, they have these shapes that is not Euclidean and not spherical. So we call this the hyperbolic geometry. So the hyperbolic geometry, mapapansin nyo na ginagamit siya for art, of course. And if you see this, this is uh, neurological and biological studies. We have promising models for social works, astronomy and cosmology, a black hole, and then Einstein's theory of relativity. So we have this application of these types of geometry.